Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. To our peril, we think about love and relationships in terms of how we feel about a person or how that person makes us feel. This attitude is understandable in children, but when adults think this way in marriage, the failure of their household becomes the failure of our neighborhoods, our communities, and sooner or later, civil society. In the Sermon on the Mount, the love that Jesus preaches has nothing to do with how we feel. In fact, through Jesus' strict application of Torah, the worse the commandment makes us feel, the more uncomfortable pressure it puts on us, the better our chances of learning how to love others correctly. Yes, that's right. In the Gospel of Matthew, not only is love not a feeling, but almost always the love imposed by the Lord's commandment goes against what we feel. It is only when our feelings are overrun by this commandment that we have any chance of acting correctly toward our neighbor. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Poulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 249 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Last week, we talked about how the legalism of Jesus, the strictness of Jesus, pushes the law to its logical extreme in order to demonstrate to the followers of Jesus that they have fallen short in trying to adhere to the letter of the law, to show all of us that we are unrighteous. And that pattern continues as the sermon continues. Jesus pushes an adherence to the law to the extreme of love for the neighbor. When people talk about Jesus and the New Testament being nice and God being mean in the Old Testament, that's completely invalid. What people are picking up on is that Jesus has this tendency to push laws to their extreme in the direction of love. Now, I don't want anyone to think that we think that there's, you know, two different messages of Old Testament, New Testament, this has to be the first time you ever heard us if you think that that's what we're saying, because we've never said in the past that there's any disconnect. We've always made the point that there's a connection. So understand that's the direction that we need to push ourselves in everything we do. We have to push ourselves towards love for the neighbor. So this is unlocking a creativity in us as we hear the law. Okay, I understand this. How do I push myself to use this to love others more completely? And by love, I'm not talking about a feeling in my heart. I'm talking about the actions I take for their well-being. There is a direct correlation between the cruelty or the sternness of the teacher and the kindness or the capacity to love of the disciple. It seems counterintuitive, which is why in our culture, parents think that by modeling kindness, their children will be kind. It's not true. In order for your children to be kind, you have to be strict because you have to put pressure on them and show them the importance of kindness and of being loving, which is what Matthew is pushing us towards here, to show them its importance through their experience of adversity and cruelty at the hands of their teacher. And that's how the law functions here. That's what the Lord is doing in his sermon. And I think it's important to tease that out because we emphasize always the way in which we stumble over the law, we fail, and that failure produces humility in us. But at the same time, we also know how it feels to have all this pressure placed on us. And it shapes our understanding of what our neighbor is experiencing when we confront them. So you are being trained 
how to love, not just in your failure, but in the way that Jesus is putting this difficult pressure on you through your ears. This idea of love as being something that comes from a kind, soft, warm heart is not true. Only someone who is tough in the gospel is able to love those whom they don't feel anything for, who go against their feelings in order to love somebody else. We, as followers of this teaching, have to push ourselves to love in every situation. There is no situation in which we are not obliged to love. And that is the point of these teachings of Jesus in this sermon, going all the way back to the Beatitudes, where those who are showing the fruit of this teaching are not those who have warm hearts or those who feel good or those who have their backs padded or their heads rubbed because they're doing so nicely. No, it's those who are being mistreated, those who are being abused for the sake of the gospel. This is the ultimate test of whether one is acting according to the teaching. I met a man at the airport this week who shines shoes for a living, and he's been shining shoes for 50 years. And he was telling me how people have changed since 9-11. He talked about how people historically have been courteous and more patient when dealing with each other in the airport, how the airport experience was more of a social experience. But then he began to lament the way people conduct themselves now. And he gave an example of a businessman standing in line with all of his gadgets just behind a mother with children fumbling through her belongings to find her papers, to make sure that she has everything for the kids, to check her bags. And he said in the past that businessman would have assisted the mother. But something changed, and instead of helping his neighbor, that businessman now sits back and acts annoyed that he has to be bothered waiting in line behind a mother with children. There's only one way to solve that problem. Someone has to scold that man and shame him and ask him plainly, what's wrong with you? What are you thinking? What if that was your mother or your sister or your wife? or your nieces and nephews, would you act the same way? Would you be so indifferent? Now, when the New Testament puts that kind of pressure on people, sometimes adults will roll their eyes as though they don't need to hear it. But the fact of the matter is we all need to hear it all the time. We all need the pressure placed on us by this text. We all need to bear the shame of this businessman who couldn't be decent towards his neighbor. We also have to be careful because when the bar is set so low, some of us may think, oh, I loved that woman because I didn't act impatient, because I smiled rather than be upset. But what Jesus is saying is that your faint attempt to love, your faint attempt to show others that you care or whatever you think you're doing is baloney. You have to put your life to the side and give up that moment for the sake of the one who is in need. Jesus doesn't allow that margin for smugness because by pushing these laws to the extreme, he gets rid of any kind of wiggle room you might think you have to say, yeah, no, no, I did it. I, I did what I was supposed to do. No, no, no. He always finds a way to squeeze you out of that wiggle room leaving you nothing left but a complete sacrifice of the self for the sake of love. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. A couple of points here. Number one, it says lust in the New American Standard Bible, but the original term in Greek is epithemeo, which means not just to desire, but also to covet. It has the connotation of desire and lust, but also wanting something that you can't have. On the one hand, it's setting a very high bar to show you that you've already failed. In other words, if you think that simply by not cheating on your spouse, you haven't committed adultery, I've got news for you. If you've even thought about it, you're already condemned. But earlier, Richard, you and I were chatting, and this terminology of coveting and, of course, the technical function of adultery in the Old Testament 
speaks to a broader question of fidelity. It's about being at ease with what you have and what God has provided for you. It's about being satisfied with what you have. The problem here is covetousness. Covetousness is wanting the thing that you don't have. You have your wife, and you look at another woman, you say, oh, I wish I had that wife. Actually, Jesus is not talking about sex. He's talking about wanting something that's not yours. It says you're not supposed to commit adultery. People take that as a very narrow view and thinking it has to do with sex. No, it's not talking about that. It's talking about remaining faithful. As soon as you get in an argument with your wife and you talk to a nice woman at work who shows you sympathy when your wife was on your case because you're not doing enough to help around the house, you're done because you already preferred having the conversation with that woman and having that interaction with that woman as opposed to your wife and listening to your wife and doing what it takes to love your wife. That's all it's talking about. I mean, you can't wiggle around this. Anything that you say, that's it. You're done. That's adultery because you have not remained faithful, not only to your wife, but to the God who provided that wife for you, to whom you are dedicated in love. Another way to think of this example of adultery, which is a persistent example in Scripture because it's so elemental, so practical, and so foundational for human society. Because if a man is not faithful to his wife, it does damage to the community. And ultimately, the Torah is about our accountability to community. The point here is that when you stray in your thoughts from your pure devotion to God or to your wife or to your community, because of your desire for something, your selfish desire for something, you've already transgressed the bond of community. You've already transgressed your fidelity, your purity of heart. Remember, your clarity, your single-mindedness towards your fidelity to the biblical God. All of that has been undermined when you simply stray in your thoughts. And then you have to ask, who then is truly faithful to God? Who is pure in heart? Who is dedicated with single-mindedness to the worship of the God of Israel? The answer, if you're honest, has to be nobody. Nobody can be that dedicated. There isn't a person listening to this podcast who hasn't strayed from God in their thoughts, let alone looked at another man or a woman at some point and said, oh my, they're attractive. Once you've done that, you have a problem. So again, Jesus is being very strict in his full application of the law of Moses in order to show us that we are not righteous. I like, Father, that you brought in the purity of heart because this does fit so nicely in that your purity of heart and the Beatitudes, as we discussed, has to be about single-mindedness. And this has to be single-mindedness about your spouse, that there is no other option, not even of what your wife could be. You have to love your spouse as your spouse is right now. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it out from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. When I was a child and read this, I had the distinct feeling that I was going to be thrown into hell, and that's why children will enter the kingdom of God before all of us, because if that's what you hear when you hear these verses, you're hearing it correctly. Jesus is driving home the point that we're condemned, because what reasonable person on hearing this text, Richard, is going to pluck their eye out or cut off their hand? I mean, what reasonable person would do this? No one is going to do that, which means that everyone is under condemnation. The problem is, if you followed this lesson as you were supposed to, you'd have no more eyes and no more hands, and all the cutting would end at that point, because you'd end up looking like the knight in the Monty Python Holy Grail movie with no arms and no legs, because there'd be nothing left. We always have a member that is trying to go astray. What Jesus is saying is, if you really were actually dedicated to this teaching, you would have nothing left. You would be so dedicated that any piece of you that was unfaithful to this teaching, you would remove because it was your stumbling block. 
But in fact, the stumbling block comes from our thoughts, as it says here, is our thoughts that have mastery over our members. So we're stuck. But again, he's pushing it to the extreme. If you were dedicated, you would remove every single stumbling block, even if that stumbling block were as precious to you as your own right eye. And it should not be lost on our listeners that the two examples of a member to be severed are the eye and the hand. The eye, we will hear later in the Sermon on the Mount, is the lamp of the body. It's the very thing that you use to project your idolatry onto the world. And the hand is the hand of the unrighteous one who holds bribes in his right hand, as we hear in the Psalter, who has a wicked plot. So we project our idols onto the heavens with our eyes. That's how we see. And Scripture isn't interested in what we see. It's interested in controlling what we hear. And if we're guided by what we see, we commit wicked deeds with our hands. But I think the deeper point, Richard, is that we would have to not only cut off all of our members, but ultimately give our life in order to fulfill the law of Moses. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So you've been told that you were allowed to put away your wife as long as you wrote out this writ. In fact, you're not allowed to put away your wife. Why is this? Because she was given to you by God. The only way you would put her away is if you had an idea of what would be better for your life going against what God has put in front of you. Notice the only exception here is if she commits adultery. Does this mean that you are then free from this commitment? No, by no means. If your wife wants to leave you, you're not allowed to stop her. But if you want to leave your wife, you by no means have the right. In either case, you must submit to God's will. If you want to leave her, no choice. If she wants to leave you, no choice. A certificate of divorce, a formal annulment or blessing to divorce, none of these things gets you off of the hook for the fact that you did not remain committed to your relationship with another person. Now, you have to hear this legalism very seriously. In other words, Moses allowed you to have a certificate of divorce because he was showing compassion on you despite the hardness of your heart. But because he gave you a certificate of divorce, do you think it makes it okay that you didn't stick with your community? You didn't stick with your spouse, which affects your entire community, affects all those around you? Of course it's not okay. So people are going to get divorced, and God through his wisdom, may choose to be merciful or not to be merciful, and there's no way to discern what his reasoning is. But even if he shows mercy and allows a certificate of divorce, you cannot presume that that means you are okay and what you did was fine. You have to accept the fact that you have fallen short of what God has willed for his people in his divine instruction. And to be honest, if you look at the state of things in our society, I wish more people were more serious about this commandment. I'm amazed, Richard, at how much energy Christians spend criticizing everybody else. And yet we have this crisis in Christian communities of the divorce rate being the same or worse than it is everywhere else. So why are we busy criticizing others when we can't keep our own house in order on something that is basic and foundational and expected of us? It's important to hear the instruction and to understand what the text is saying and to be faithful to it with a kind of purity of heart. And when you take the two pieces together that we've talked about today, again, Jesus does not allow smugness. You can't feel smug that you didn't divorce your wife. Because at any point that you said, even in the most private parts of your heart, if only she didn't argue with me so much, 
You've already shown yourself to be unfaithful. There is no space for you to be smug, okay? Every bit of you has to be willing to be sacrificed, your eye, your hand, for the sake of loving your spouse, and you are not that faithful. Therefore, at any point here, you can see that you are guilty. People think this is all about sex. It's clearly not about sex. It's about your faithfulness to your spouse in every thought and every deed and every step that you take so that every word that comes out of your mouth has to be faithful to your wife. Every bit of you has to be faithful. So the person who's making this about sex is already going off the path. They're already making this way too specific to let themselves off the hook. If I can control this, then I'm okay. No. Any word, any thought, any step, and you are already committing adultery. I'll give you an example, Rich, to illustrate your point. Take a couple that stay married for 50 years, and they never cheat on each other. They stay committed to each other. But during the course of that relationship, they abuse each other. They are cruel. They are neglectful. They mistreat each other. They show no courtesy. And everybody around them sees that they're miserable. They're not miserable because of their circumstance. Again, I want to be very clear. I am extremely critical of the way we talk about relationships and love in our society. We talk about falling out of love, which is the most juvenile, idiotic way to talk about a relationship of 50 years that I have ever heard. Love is not something you feel if you are scriptural. Love is a decision to act correctly towards another person. And every time you remain committed to staying in a relationship in order to save face, but you don't remain committed to the law of the Lord that you are to love your neighbor, you may think that you're righteous because you stuck it out, but the damage you've done to the community remains. How many times have we heard people say it's better to get out of a marriage than to mistreat each other, and then they cite the example of their parents who mistreated each other terribly all those years? What Scripture is saying is, yes, your parents were wrong, but the answer isn't to quit. The answer is to look at the person who you're uncomfortable with or who you dislike and change your behavior towards them. That is what this law is about. And if we come to a point where people can't even change their behavior towards their spouse, how do we expect the businessman standing in line to care about a woman fumbling with her things and dealing with children at the airport? I'm afraid if you asked him if that's how he would act around his wife, I would hate to hear the answer because it may be, yes, that's precisely how I would act around my wife. It's come to that point. Courtesy is of the utmost importance because it reflects our decision, our choice in every moment to treat our neighbor lovingly. Courtesy is not simply a formality. It is a discipline. It is a way of life. It is forcing yourself to always look at the needs of others and to put them before your own, no matter how you feel. That's why it's so wicked. In a very technical sense, scripturally, it's so wicked to say that you fell out of love with your spouse. You have no right to fall out of love. I know that sounds silly to an American audience because your frame of reference for love is how you feel and what others do for you. But that's why there are so few adults left, because there's been a kind of stunted growth emotionally and psychologically, because we have glorified and elevated selfishness as a virtue. That is what the Lord is attacking in the Sermon on the Mount, and very specifically in the example of adultery and divorce. This is not about feelings. This is about single-mindedly remaining faithful to the spouse that God has given to you. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.